This is Dave Bortner, Freedom Boat Service. We're celebrating our 10th anniversary in business, and we happened to run across these cassette tapes that were produced as part of the Antique Motorboating Symposium, uh, March 31st through April 2nd of 1995 at the Mariner's Museum. We thought it would be a wonderful opportunity to digitize these presentations by icons and luminaries of our hobby. We hope you enjoy listening to them and uh, join us in celebrating our 10 years in business. Thanks. This next file is a rollicking discussion about buying the right boat and protecting your investment. It's really interesting to hear that from the perspective of uh, the folks who are making this presentation, which include Wayne Moxfield, Pete Henkel, Gary Sherb, and Wilson Wright. It's very interesting to hear their differences and likenesses in uh, talking about which boat is best for most people. And Tom, uh, while we're doing these little uh, promotionals here, uh, uh, that we're going to have here this afternoon, uh, it, uh, it seems unnecessary for Wilson Wright, known by very few of you, to introduce three distinguished gentlemen who are known by virtually everybody in this room. And uh, I'm not going to introduce them in the order that they're uh, in your program, but rather in the way I see them standing over there. And the first is, uh, and biggest, is one of the premier boat restorers in America, hails from Sarasota, Florida, uh, grew up on Lake Hapatcong, New Jersey, uh, knew every Chris Craft and I guess every other boat that was on that lake, and as a child growing up with these boats, recalls them much like I recall the name and face of my first grade teacher, even though I can't remember the person I met out in the hall this morning. And I'm not sure that Gary can remember the person he met this morning, but he remembers the boats of the 50s and 60s, and uh, he's in the restoration business. He's been known to broker a boat and knows a good bit about the subject of this afternoon's panel. And Gary, come on up and take a seat. Uh, lake Apatcong is a neat little lake about an hour out of New York City. And it seems to harbor wonderful people. And the next guy is the next one I'm going to invite to come take a seat up here, and that's Wayne Moxfield, who has been restoring boats on that lake since, uh, well, before Christ's coming, I would think. At least that's <laughs> what they tell us. Uh, and Wayne has been in the bilge of, I guess, every imaginable boat, and like Gary, recalls all of these boats intimately, and has been in the business of buying and selling and restoring, and he too knows a good bit about boats. Uh, I think that we're about to capture Wayne down in Florida. He's uh, bought a piece of property not too far from Homosassa down on the west coast of Florida, and he may uh, become a uh, half New Jerseyan, half uh, Floridian. Wayne, come on up and take a seat. From a slightly different part of the country, Harsons Island, Michigan not too far up the river from Algonac, which is where the first, and I guess I call it the mother plant for Chris Craft. No, I don't call it, oh, I can call it the mother plant. Uh, Pete Henkel, probably best known for being on the cover of the legend of Chris Craft uh, in his gorgeous Chris Craft. Uh, probably knows uh, more about uh, engines maybe than uh, our two friends over, over here, certainly he knows more about the Scripps engine, I think, than anybody in America, if not anybody in the world. Uh, probably knows where all of the missing parts are for that Scripps that you may want to put back together or that your friends may want to put back together. Very much into Chris Crafts, uh, into the sale of parts and boats and brokering, and uh, has done a lot, of bit, a lot of restoration and has traveled uh, America in boats. I don't think there's a river cruise that's been held that Pete Henkel hasn't been a part of it. Pete Henkel, the man on the cover of The Legend of Chris Craft, come on up. There was a fella in a movie who said, you don't know what you're going to find in a box of chocolates. 
and I don't know what we're going to find in this box of chocolates over here. <laughs> but I think we're going to find some interesting comments about how you get into boating, where you start, what you need to consider when you think about values, and what does value mean to you, and how does value mean something different to the guy next to you. And uh, it's going to be a very informal session. If anybody gets thirsty, I think the coffee pot's still right outside and it's still warm. Uh, feel free to, to get up and move around and stretch, especially if we get to going on too long. Uh, but I'm going to, I think, let our panelists open up the program here with some ideas that they have on how you determine the value of a boat and how you protect uh, your investment. So with that, uh, Gary, since you're in the middle, do you want to, uh, to open up the box of chocolates? <laughs> uh, prior to this uh, session, uh, the three of us sat down and uh, we were trying to uh, uh, look at what might be the way uh, that we could start uh, a discussion uh, that would have the most good for uh, everybody here in terms of uh, the subject uh, that we've been asked to work with. Uh, and uh, Wayne came up with what uh, probably is the best uh, uh, answer to that is that every one of these boats, every one of the wood boats that, that we could talk about has a value. It is something that is worth being restored uh, to varying degrees. And part of what we might be able to achieve today uh, is to look at how you might go about that, how you would go about protecting the value of what you have done with that boat that you found, and some of the ways that you may want to get started in doing it. Uh, the important part of, uh, of this discussion really is the feedback from you out there. And uh, I would encourage you all to ask questions if you, this is the chance to get a a viewpoint uh, uh, from us, uh, from other people in the audience, etc. Uh, but that's that's kind of the direction that we thought might be interesting uh, for you all to uh, to see it uh, go in. Uh, I've talked in over the years to a number of people that come into our shop, and uh, they're uh, looking at. A first boat, they've been to a boat show or they've uh, been on a ride in another person's boat and uh, they think that they want to own uh, an antique boat and often have an idea that that boat uh, might be something that they grew up with or their uncle had or their next door neighbor had and now we're in a position in life where we can financially afford to look at doing something that we'd like to have fun with. Uh, but often the perception of what you want to start with uh, isn't as good or, uh, or the correct boat for what you may find yourself ending up with after you've used it for a period of time. So I think that from my viewpoint, uh, it's very important that you analyze carefully what you are really going to do with the boat before you buy one, where you're going to use it, how you're going to use it. Is it going to be uh, stored in a garage? Is it going to be in a boathouse? Is it going to be kept in a slip in the water all the time? All of these things are going to have a lot to do with the type, style, construction, and the degree of restoration that you might want to do on a boat. Uh, from there, we can go in a lot of different directions. And I know Wayne has some pretty <laughs> strong <laughs> ideas on, on, the, on how to go about that. Well, like Gary said, really the first thing you have to do is decide what you want. From there you uh, have to see what the boat really needs and uh, decide whether you're going to do the restoration yourself. If you are, the Mariner's Museum is basically the first place for you to start. They have the complete files and records of all of your, your Chris Craft boats. And from there you can get the uh, perfect picture of what that boat was really supposed to look like. 
once again, it depends on your talents. How much talent do you really have? Uh, are you capable of doing a professional restoration? I was in the, year, in the business itself for 25 years, and it was a hobby of mine for many years before that. And uh, one thing that I have found over the years is that I've sold a lot of boats to a lot of people. Many of them could not afford to have their boat brought to a marina to have it professionally restored. And they would come to me and, and ask me specifics about them, and I was always very honest and always tried to tell them exactly the way to do things. Uh, one of the big things is how much talent you really have. Are you an expert at refinishing? Do you know how to sand? Do you know what kind of stain you want to use, the varnishes, and so on and so forth? But like I say, the Mariner's Museum has all of these super detailed pictures of, of the Chris Craft boats, and uh, you can really get a good idea from there. And like I say, it depends how much uh, you really want to get into this and how, how perfect do you want the end result. So <clears throat> it's, it's an interesting concept, and uh, it's a matter of where you really, really want to go. Most of, all of us that are in the restoration business would definitely help you out as far as the details and the, uh, the specifics as far as working out the the ways to, to get into this. The, one of the big problems, I think, over the years is no one has ever really written a book on how to do it. I've often thought of it, but <laughs> never really got around to it. Um, <clears throat> anybody have any questions about uh, the specifics of any of these things? Or the, uh, one, of the th the, one of the things that goes along with what uh, uh, Wayne has uh, said about choosing the boat, uh, I, I Often, uh, people will will look at a boat, and and the stars are in your eyes. You see, you're. Let's like take a scenario of someone just starting out with it, going and looking at it, and saying, you know, I would like to get into owning an antique boat, but I they haven't done uh, or don't know where to find enough information about where to find a boat, uh, what style, etc., would be the best one for their purposes. Many many times these. Uh, a person will find a boat by accident. It'll be in a local paper. It'll be for sale for a thousand dollars, or you know, those days are gone. I guess we'd like to say, <laughs> but whatever the number is, uh, uh, and in pretty tough condition. And the desire to have it often overcomes the the uh, care of looking at what's really there before buying it. And we'll see many many times we see boats come to the shop uh, where. Uh, to be restored, uh, that an owner has bought that is missing all of the hardware. Uh, the wood is the easy part of the replacement. The pieces that are made from patterns, the steering gears, the steering wheels, those are the very tough things to find and becoming tougher, especially if you want all original uh, on it. There's a lot of replica hardware that's available that is very good, but it is also very expensive. So the more of the pieces that you have with the boat, with the boat, physically with it, correct pieces, and knowing which ones are correct and which ones are not, are going to help you save an awful lot of money in aggravation uh, in restoring whatever boat it is, be it a Chris Craft or a Century or a Garwood or a 15-footer or a 26-footer. Uh, the size just makes things get more expensive because there's more of them on the boat. Uh, so, so identifying what is as complete a boat as you can find for the best price that you can get it. And, and, and in that sense, by pay, paying a fair price for the best boat is the safest thing you can do when you start out. Uh, if you start with a $500 hull, uh, an 18-foot Riviera, let's say, that has uh, three cleats, one bow light, no windshield, no instrument, no hardware, you may have paid $500 for it, but I can guarantee you that unless you do all of the work yourself, and I mean all of it, including rebuilding the engine, you will be well past what that boat is actually worth in today's market by the time you finish restoring it. Therefore, if you are going to buy a boat that you intend to have restored, the best thing that you can do is pay more money for a better boat and bring it to the next level. That's true of any, whatever size it is. The other thing that's important from a restoration standpoint is that if you're dealing with an 18-footer, 
and you're dealing with a 26 foot boat, the difference in size isn't too much, but the, and, and the wood in it, there isn't a whole lot more wood in it, but the value difference can be quite substantial. It is easier to justify the restoration costs on the larger boat, on a triple cockpit, for example, than maybe a forty, fifty thousand dollar boat, than it is when you're working trying to restore completely woodwork, chrome, everything else in a sixteen or fifteen foot boat, unless you are doing it some portion of it yourself. Those are all considerations that come into place that many people don't think about before they buy the boat. And I know Peter will find that with with engines, it becomes very important. Well, I, <clears throat> sometimes I think the best buy is to find a boat that somebody somebody has already totally restored. <laughs> You'll spend much, le much less money in the long run. Uh, I see, have seen through the years the uh, people buy boats and uh, they perhaps don't come and get some advice until it's too late and they may have taken a disc to the side rather than buying paint remover, uh, paint and varnish remover to remove, remove the varnish and they've really destroyed the wood. Uh, so it's important to come to someone and get some uh, some good advice as to which way you want to go and how you want to do it. I've seen an awful lot of people that come in uh, that have been working on a boat for an extended period of time uh, and they become discouraged because they're not seeing any progress. Uh, it's very difficult to become a weekend boat restorer and uh, see the see re real progress unless you really stick to it. Usually somebody comes over and you have a couple of beers and you sit around and talk and really don't do a lot of work. So it's, imp it's important to, that you've got to put, put a lot of time in these things. So. Which is all right if that was your initial objective. Right. Well, <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's always a, a, another member of the family here or members of the family that uh, will demand your time to do other things other than to, to make a mess in the garage and make uh, make sure that their cars stay outside in the winter time or whatever um, I think whatever you do if, if you buy a boat uh, whatever you pick out it's important to do whatever you do to do it right not to do a patch or band-aid type job on it it may look pretty for a while but it's not lasting and if you put do not do it properly what your effort is going in could be for naught it could be it could actually cost you money to do things improperly I see an awful lot of people that find friends, uh, perhaps that have a plating business of some sort, and they take their stuff in to have it plated because they're going to get a bargain, and they end up having a lot of the hardware, the detail, buffed right off the, the castings. The, the holes become egg-shaped, the details disappear, and uh, they've actually, by saving a few dollars, have spent, wasted a lot of money. Their hardware is gone. Not in total, but I mean it's, it, the detail is gone on it. That's... Uh Good point on that, on the, uh, the 40s Chris Crafts. Uh, I walked into a uh, customer's uh, shop one day, uh, his garage, and he had bought a couple of boats from me and that he was restoring over a period of time. And this was the first one that he was doing, and he had bought a, a, a little deluxe runabout that had a perfect, absolutely perfect dash panel on it, which has the machine turnings on the back of the panel. And as I walked into the shop, he was almost white, and sitting on there was a can of Ioso. He had sat down, and he was going to polish the nickel silver on the dashboard, and he had just started a little bit up in the upper corner and had taken all of the machine turnings on a section about that big out of the dashboard, out of a perfect dashboard, because he had tried to polish it with an abrasive polish instead of just cleaning it with a liquid cleaner that will, that will take the cast off the nickel silver. So, you know, at, he went from a point of having something very original that was not going to cost him a lot of money to uh, something that was going to cost him upwards of four, five, six hundred dollars to sit down or send out and have redone. Or he was going to be sitting there with a the little thing doing it all himself to get it back to its original. So what you do with, without having knowledge before and starting something can be very dangerous and cause you a lot of time and a lot of extra work that's not necessary, plus damage a very correct original boat. So in some ways, it's a good idea to start with something that isn't a major uh, 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 undertaking in the sense that, uh, uh, you know, there's a lot of 17-foot sportsmen and a lot of uh, uh, 50s cockpit boats and a lot of ski boats out there that can teach you an awful lot about a wood boat, its care, what it'll do, how it'll do it, 
uh, and what it's going to require of you that that is fairly easy to do and, and isn't hard on the pocketbook. Uh, on the other hand, starting as a first boat and, and, and paying some major dollars for a barrel back, for example, and restoring it incorrectly, you've done a disservice to the boat, which we really are should be passing on to the next generation better than we got it. Uh, and you've also can potentially cost yourselves a lot of money to get it straightened out. Uh, I mean, we've all had many boats come into the shop that have been started by people restore with the grand ideas of restoring the boat, and it then comes into the shop, and when you get to, uh, in a discussion, uh, one of the first things that we ask is, and not because we're nosy on it particularly, but because we're trying to protect the, the, the customer from going way over the other side of the hill, is what they paid for the boat. And, and in many t cases, you find that they, that they have bought a boat for way too much money for what it was, and now cannot restore it, but have the boat, and their wife is telling them, I want it out of the room, or something's got to happen, it's been there four years, and the alternative is to take it to have a professional restorer do the boat. At that point, uh, the best thing that I can do with, with somebody that I know that is, is in that position is tell them, take your loss now and sell the boat to someone who will actually, who has the skills to restore it. And then if you still want a boat, what Pete said is very true for that individual. Buy it from somebody who's restored it already and, and you know, did a 18 Riviera and now wants a 23 triple cockpit or whatever. You know, they're, they are moving to the next one. And that will cost them far less. And in the long run, they will have bought the boat for a fair market value price, which historically has gone up, and they will recover back what they lost on the mistake they made the first time. But to go ahead and, and restore that boat and pay a professional restorer uh, uh, like us uh, to be way past what it's worth is, uh, is uh, it's hard for me to, to see somebody do that unless that is the exact boat that they want or it belonged to you know great uncle george and they are never going to get rid of it in their foreseeable future for any rhyme or reason and i i we've all heard that statement many times no not going to sell it never going to get rid of it well that's the same person that comes back two years later and says i want a cadet instead of the u-22 they bought and restored the first time but uh, so where you're going to go with the boat, what you're going to do with it, as best as you can in the, before you buy that first one is very important. You'll find out after you've had it how much you want to have a different style or, or whether the decision was right, but at least you've, had, you've thought about it before, the, before you've bought it. I think in large measure what Gary is saying is you need to do a lot of homework. And probably this conversation is really aimed at people who are way outside this room who haven't found their way in here and won't for another three or four years. Uh, but you wouldn't go out and buy a new stock without either doing some research on your own about the company's profitability, what they make, what the forecast is for their, their stocks, or else buying it from a stockbroker in whom you have some trust and faith. And by the same token, uh, you ought not to buy a boat without having some idea of what is this thing that I'm buying and, and what happens is somebody will see that isolated case in the local paper, uh, Chris Craft, Sportsman or Riviera for sale and they think, my gosh, I haven't ever seen one of these advertised before. It must be the only one in the world. And they go without doing a, a bit of research and go buy the thing at whatever the asking price is because another one is never going to come along. Uh, and that's where they get into trouble. You, whether it's antique teapots, antique cars, antique anything else, and there's a myriad of collectibles out there. I can't tell you how many collectible magazines I get. Uh, but you've you got to do your research. I wouldn't go out and buy a, an antique teapot for if my life depended on it, because I got no earthly idea what the thing's worth or what I would do with it or how I could resell it. And Gary mentions, uh, well, it depends upon what you're going to do with it. And a lot of people call us because they've seen reference to the organization in some magazine or maybe like that Kiplinger thing. And I say, well, what are you going to do with the boat? 
And there's a long silence. Well, what do you mean? What am I going to do with a boat? I'm going to put it in the water and I'm going to drive it, right? What else would I do with it? Well, it, there's a lot of things you can do with a boat. Uh, you can put modern power in it and you can water ski the kids around the lake and, and have it simply because you like wood better than you like plastic. Uh, you can have a wooden boat because you want to turn a few heads at the fueling dock or the yacht club on a Sunday afternoon. Or you can have it because you want to take it to a boat show and come home with a lot of hardware. And if you want to come home with a lot of hardware, you're going to spend a little bit of money or else you're going to learn a lot about doing your own work uh, in order to make that a 100-point boat so that you can bring home the hardware. If you're just going to water ski the kids around the lake, it really doesn't matter whether you got the original engine in it or some other engine because nobody knows what's under that box or under that hatch but you, and it really doesn't matter. And if some friend looked, they wouldn't know, I mean, any more than I'd know about the teapot. And so uh, this question of what are you going to do with the boat uh, has far greater ramifications than a lot of people think. Goody? What do I do? <laughs> well, you, did, you have to plot out better the location of the antique boat places in relation to the antique furniture stores and other things, and the closer they are, the safer you are if you make the pass and drop her off there first. We, it's, not a, it's not as out. out. Um, it, I'll tell you, it is not. We're located. We're in Sarasota, Florida, and we have a lot of antique dealers and a lot of you know, beaches and other stuff like that. And it's it always fascinates me how uh, people will come in at our shop in the winter time you know, when they're on touring in Florida. And many of you have come by and visited us, and they'll come by, uh, you know, a quick pass through to to find out how to get there, and then they're out in and out in five minutes or ten minutes, and the wife's with them and out. And about three hours later, or the next day, here he comes, dad back in again, nobody else, and he's there for two hours. And we get, you know, go through whatever, and, and uh, you know, the wife is either at the beach or at the antique stores. And Goody, yeah. I'd say you ought to be the last one in the room to ask that question, because I can That's look right. all the way down. I can look at John Harvey, who's here without wife, Dean Guy, who's here without wife, Lou Rao, who's here without wife, and I can go all the way back and butt that side of the room. At least Nancy's here. Uh, she isn't. Wilson Wright's here without wife. Uh, where's Ingrid, Gary? I guess. <laughs> uh, but you, you get the idea? They've got their interests, and we've got ours, and, you know, it's kind of like anything else in the family. As my wife says about going to boat shows, well, I've kicked enough tires in my lifetime. Do I need to go back and look at another piece of mahogany? I think, well, they're all different. One of the, you know? one of the things that, that some of you may not have done yet, uh, and you'll find is a, is a is a very enjoyable use for an antique boat, and that's cruising, touring. And there, some of you, some of you may have gone on the St. John's River cruise that Dean uh, runs every year uh, down in our chapter. We did the Mississippi River with the group out there last year, Tennessee River that the Jorgensons put together. And if you choose, if you like to do that kind of thing, and it is a lot of fun. I mean, I enjoy that much more than sitting around at boat shows and, and collecting hardware because that is running the boat. That is having fun with what it's designed to do. And if you choose that kind of an activity, then you have to think about the kind of boat that you're going to use for that also. And you're not going to do that as often as an 18-foot Riviera or a 19-foot barrel back because those boats were designed to go on lakes, to go from the club to the house and back and back and forth. And that was it. You were in the boat for 25 minutes. It was a speedboat around a circle back to the boathouse. So the, the application that you are going to put the boat to has an awful lot to do with, with what direction you go with it. One of the things I'd like to know is what direction do you, want to, do you all want to see the, this, this discussion go? Well, what before you, you go that far, Gary, you might even want to look at what type. You, you certainly don't want to buy a 17-foot flat-bottom ski boat to go out in the middle of Lake Michigan. Uh, you need to figure out what kind of body you're, you're going to use this boat in. If you're going to water ski, then you want to buy a ski boat. But if you want to go out in a bigger lake, I think Pete would probably tell you you want a big triple cockpit or, or something a little more sturdy. With some weight. With some weight, right. I see Dean has a mic over there. Yeah. Uh, 
Gary touched on this. Uh, would your panel give us some guidance about relative safety of investment in boats? Uh, assume that that two years comes along and you want to resell. Where would you have been most successful in placing your money to get your money back out? What types of boats? Well, that, that's a, a difficult one to approach in that direction, actually, Dean. Uh, all of these boats have value. And the big thing is how much you actually have invested in these, whether you've done the restoration yourself or whether you just went out and purchased the boat from someone else. I've always believed that there's always someone out there that is willing to buy your boat, and you have to wait until that person really comes along. Um, there are various methods to advertise the boats for sale. You know all the different publications that are out, all of the newsletters, and so on and so forth. But it's not a kind of thing that you're going to be able to sell instantly. You have to wait for the right person to come along. I've sold a boat that I may have had for five or ten years. I've had, I had one boat that came on the market for 45 minutes. It took me 45 minutes to sell this boat. Absolutely unbelievable. But this is the way it goes. The big thing is always to try not to get too much invested in it. The less you have invested, the easier it is to sell. The other angle is, which boat is it that you have to sell? There are certain boats that I think all of us know that do have a tremendous amount of value and that are worth uh, some really big dollars. And uh, you can get into that subject as far as all the different, different ones are concerned, the different models. Yeah. Uh, one, one thing that, that uh, uh, from the standpoint of, of a restoration shop or if you're dealing with somebody doing the boat for you, uh, when, very early on in our discussion with the customer when they bring a boat to us or buy one that we have and we're restoring it for them, uh, we sit down with it and, and it is very difficult to do a, a end costs beginning study when you start the boat. What we do try and do and work with the customer on is, is that boat should not end up way on the other side of what the restored market value of a mint condition version of that boat is. And the only way that you can determine that is by what they've sold for, what they're advertised for, and how long they stay on the market, uh, and just uh, an awareness of, of what's happening to certain models. And then looking at that and saying if a boat is $35,000 and, and the hull itself in the beginning costs five, then we've got $30,000, you know, $30,000, $35,000 uh, to play with uh, to get that boat finished and restored, complete, and if that can happen, the owner is on the right side of what that boat is worth at that particular point. The second thing is that the, the time frame that you gave, Dean, uh, is very difficult to work with. Uh, two years is a short period of time from the, from the completion of a restoration, whether it be done by a shop or by an individual. Uh, I try and look at it and, and, and put a time frame of saying, if, you're gonna, if you keep the boat for five years, and you're within the range of what it's worth right now on the day that it's finished, you've got a, you know, you've, you're in pretty good shape for that, uh, for that particular, whatever the model is. Uh, the other uh, side of that coin uh, is that uh, the boat itself, the cost of the hull, engine, and, and the restoration is what you're considering as a preserved cost, and let's say that boat was $20,000 when you got all fun, finished or whatever it was. Uh, the cost is not the added trailer, cover, maintenance, oil changes, and repairs you have to do after that point to the engine. That to me is just exactly the same as going and playing a round of golf. You play it, enjoy it, have fun with it, go out in the boat and enjoy it, go hit the golf ball. When you're all done, you go home, you've parted with the greens fees and you don't have them back, but you have the fun you've had doing it. The maintenance and upkeep and the extra coats of varnish from year to year to keep that boat at a level, that's what that is, greens fees. The basic cost of what that boat cost you initially and the restoration is where you should be in a realistic world. And I've, had it, I've heard it many times when people come back and say, 
well, I've got $35,000 in this boat, and it's a $20,000 boat, and I know what the restoration on it costs, and what they're doing is adding everything in, every single dime, now that they want to get out of it, and said, so that's what I want to get back, everything I put out. Well, it doesn't work that way. We can't go get our golf game back. And, and that's the difference of what you're really trying to protect, that core. And then it's a question of where you go from there. I tell many customers it's, um, <clears throat> it's cheaper not to own the boat, but it's cheaper to find somebody that has a boat that you like to ride in. And pay <laughs> a lot of money and a lot of gas. You, you, <laughs> you fill up the tank with gas, you, come, you show up with a, the with a picnic lunch or whatever, uh, and a bottle of scotch and a case of beer, and when it's all over with, you invite them out to dinner, and uh, they have to clean up the mess, and they have to pay the insurance, and they have to take care of the boat, and you go on home, and but you've had a nice day. So but that's the way, sometimes the way to find out what sort of a boat you like, too, to find some people. That yeah. Another thing that uh, gives significance to what Wayne said earlier, which I think in a word was patience, is the fact that we're in a very, very small niche. Uh, we've got a little over 2,000 members in the Chris Craft Club. Uh, ACBS is, uh, I guess, knocking at 4,000. Uh, Norm Wangard back there with Classic Boating's probably got, what, 10,000? 10, no more than 15,000 subscribers. A and that's a very small niche of people who are interested in what we're doing. And especially with young people, you, gotta, you can't finance these things. So how many people are walking down the street with ten to twenty thousand dollars of disposable income in their pocket that they're ready to to uh, lay out for uh, an antique boat? And it's a very small number. And because it's a very small number, you, you got to sit and wait for that guy to, you know, see your ad or or see however it is that you displayed your boat. So it it's going to take some time. And I think Wilson, that's what Wayne's telling you. If I could jump in just a second, fellas, uh, I'm. One of those fellows Wilson recent, briefly referred to a moment ago, I'm a new classic boat owner. Uh, I decided before I got the boat that I was going to uh, be a purist, if you will. Uh, it's a utility. I intend to use it for fishing and skiing and cruising. Uh, my question is, what impact on value does original wood replacement have? Obviously, if wood's rotten, you've got to replace it, but uh, if, you, if you're going to replace a few planks in the bottom, is it best to re-bottom the whole thing? It's always nice to have a new bottom in a boat because it won't leak. <laughs> that does definitely not detract from the value of the boat. If anything, that would add to the value of the boat. As long as you put it back basically the way it was, um, you know, don't... Uh, Use a, a pl put plywood on the outside of it rather than the planks and so on and so forth. Uh, I myself am a, a, a purist as such, and uh, any boats that I restored over the years, I, I put the bottoms back on exactly the way that Chris Craft did, just using some of their updated methods like possibly an interior bottom, the inner bottom, out of plywood. I always stayed with the uh, original type way that they did it. In other words, they used bedding compound, but what I would use today would be 3M's 5200. It's an adhesive and sealant, and the boat goes back basically the, exactly the same way that it, it was built originally, and it, and it won't leak if it's done properly. Just put that 5200 in there. Follow the same screw patterns. Use your silicone bronze screws. Uh, normally plug the bottom of the boat rather than just using a putty in it. You know, just little things like that. Um, I know there are plenty of other fellows here that believe in the West system, but I'm still a purist and like to do things the old-fashioned way and am very happy with all the results that I've had with all of the restorations I've done over the years that way. Anyone else? Okay. Hey, uh, let me ask a question for the panel. Uh, one of the things that I run into at the boat shows all the time when we're judging the boats is uh, modern power versus original power. And what's happening is the boats that we're finding today that we would like to restore are all the derelicts that have been pretty well left. Uh, the, the boats uh, where you can drive up and find something that has original power in now, is pretty, they're pretty well gone. And they're out there and they've been redone. So as we get out there and dig through the trenches looking for these old boats, very few have original power. So you find something that, uh, that needs a... a a fairly expensive engine. You get into A70s or A120s or Scripps or something like that, we're talking about a lot of money. 
Uh, I, I'd like to ask the panel, what, what, sh what do you feel or how do you feel about original power versus, uh, you know, uh, modern power, something that you can get out there and use? Uh, and it's a question that, that comes up at all the boat shows, uh, all the judges meeting, we talk about it, and uh, where do you, you kind of see that trend going? Well, I was going to say that an awful lot of people, as an example, will have a U-22 with a Model K engine in it, which is um, a little light on power. It's fine for fishing, and it was nice for meandering along, perhaps for our grandfather. Uh, but people seem to be wanting to upgrade all the time. If they have a K, they want to go to a 105, the, or they want to put change it to a larger engine. So I'm seeing an upgrade all the time on this. I realize you're talking about some of the older, the Kermats, the Hall Scots, uh, the Scripps, et cetera, et cetera. Um, if the engines are there, it's, it, if it's, it's many times better to restore the engine and at least keep the engine with the boat and go with modern power. Now, I get a little frustrated riding around in some of these boats with the, the high RPM engines. Uh, it, it's, it's almost unnerving I'm, because I'm accustomed to the old slow-turning slow engines. And uh, so I, I like to see them stay with original power if, if they can. Yeah, yeah the... Yeah, the uh Original power on a lot of the engines, if they are done correctly, are very reliable engines. Uh, and uh, I, 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 shut, I don't like to see. I've, and it does happen. We have customers come in, and you know they'll have trouble getting an engine started. And the next thing you know, they're in, and, and well, I want to put a 283, or I want to put a 351 V8 in the boat. And uh, you know, our first inclination is, all right, here's the cost to rebuild this engine. And if we do this, you, in fact, will have a engine that will run exactly like a brand new motor. I mean, if it's rebuilt, completely rebuilt, and, and it comes down to the old, what's rebuilt? Uh, you know, that's not a valve job and, and uh, you know, a couple of pairs of rings. Uh, that's an engine that has been taken completely apart and rebuilt from one end to the other, including the starter, generator, the bearings, all the uh, uh, internals on the engine, right through to the transmission and the rear seals. That's a rebuilt engine. And that's true whether it be a Model K, whether it be a 202 Scripps or a V12 or an A70. If, if you do that to an engine and rebuild it that way, it is a reliable engine. It'll start on a 6-volt starter very, very well and be very reliable just like it was when it was brand new. And, and if you don't think that, it's, there's a lot of reasons that it doesn't, that it doesn't happen. And, uh, and remember what I'm saying is that is a correctly, completely rebuilt engine. Now, if that isn't a, a, a choice that, that you want, uh, then if, uh, as Pete said, is if, if you keep the original engine, this is particularly important if it's a runabout or a triple cockpit or anything of that nature. You would not want to separate an original engine boat. It potentially is the most valuable boat if it has modern power with the original engine still with it. Because then somebody buying it has the option of doing anything they want with it. They can go put that A70 back in it and go off and waltz off to the boat shows and collect some silver if the boat is very good and have a good time doing that and do that for two years, take the engine out, put it away, put the 454 in it, and do river cruises and have fun and run all around Lake Winnipesaukee or wherever and have a good time with the boat and have both. So that probably is the maximum value uh, if, it's, if, it's, uh, if that luxury is available. And that's true whether it be a sportsman or a, or a uh, Riviera, 20 Riviera or any of them. Well, if you are talking about uh, the, the, like the earlier V8s, the Scripps, uh, the Chris Craft A70, if you are one of the very, very few people lucky enough to have the matching serial number engine for the boat, that's a, that is a, a huge exception to anything. There's very, very few, maybe of the A70s, maybe four boats that have the original motor still in them. Four I, don't, I haven't kept track of them, so I really don't know. You know Nope. Not, not very many. Correct original style engine that matched the hull card style of what was in it, but probably not the original. Uh, 
Yeah, that, if you, a lot of the Chris Crafts, if you, for example, <coughs> Uh, uh, especially the utilities or boats built in the 50, 40s and 50s, uh, you may look at the engine and, and when you buy the boat and, and the serial number on the manifold will match the number on the card, but if you look at the side of the block casting, you'll find that the block has been replaced somewhere in its life and all they have done is kept the plate on the manifold, okay? Because many of those engines died you know, we were both on a lake that, that that was regular activity, redoing engines and replacing engines because they'd burn them up and wouldn't put oil in them or whatever, you know, case in the 50s and 60s when these things were still in use. That was the name of the game. It's all you had to run. I've never been to a boat show where they've actually been able to check numbers that no. closely. In fact, even the correct serial number on the boat, I mean, on the, on the engine as to whether it matches the boat or not. Uh, something I think we all try to do to keep those numbers all the same. Uh, in regard to, I think, your original question, if you had a Hercules in there and you want to keep original engine in, then you keep the original MBL or the KBL or whatever you have. Well, it, it could. It could. And there are some shows where they get, they get a little picky on some of that stuff. I, th I think some of it is, is probably looking, you know, trying to look in the crystal ball a few years down the road, and, and all of us have seen the changes uh, in what would be considered a, a top-level restored boat, let's say 10 years ago, 15 years ago, those boats are actually getting restored again to a different level that, that things have progressed to today. Uh, the, the, the serial number situation uh, in terms of getting down to the point of, of determining a difference between two identical boats and where do you go next. You know, I don't, and, and I'm not saying that that's something that I am a proponent of. Uh, I'm not a, a great lover of uh, judges. During the Korean conflict, which was what, 1950, well, 50, 50, 50, 54? 50, 50, it didn't seem to affect them as I know them. <laughs> well, actually, yeah, some of the better from <laughs> Well, the uh, technology uh, was improving all through this period of time, and that's probably a, one of the times when there was an increase in the technology in chrome plating, going to the double nickel process, um, and they, they went to a double copper um, setup. So I, the chrome through the years has gotten better and better. Until recently. Actually, yeah, I, you see many of the 50s boats that when they, uh, you know, when we find them and have had them in the, and they come into the shop or original chrome on them, that it's, you could actually polish it to uh, a user acceptability level, but not would not be what would be show or new. But a lot better than what you found back in the 30s when the chrome was first put on. What is the distinction in the value of a boat that has original hardware, re-chromed, and replica hardware? First of all, you come to that personal choice, which... <laughs> is really the big factor in this whole thing as far as value is concerned. It's what you really want and what you feel superly comfortable with it. There are some super old antique boats that uh, people have uh, polished the nickel on, the German silver, but believe me, if you've ever had one of those boats and you've tried to maintain it, uh, you'll probably soon go to chrome. <laughs> it's almost impossible. You could take a boat and have it superly polished today, Put it outside and the dew would come down at night or maybe even a few speckles of rain and you walk out the next morning and it's just all spotted and it's just totally a mess. It's just very, very, very impractical to keep over the years. Uh, I don't think I know more than maybe two boats <laughs> in the whole country that still have their, their German silver hardware and, and someone maintains now. it. <laughs> <laughs> the, the hardware that's being made today uh, that you're referring to is the newer hardware many times is made from the is made from off the original patterns uh, there are a number of foundries that are still in business making some of this hardware and so in reality it's uh, it's fresh freshly cast uh, and plated etc but it's still the same so it would be difficult to tell the difference one of the in in relation to the nickel silver boats which are the the early prior to 31 uh, 26 foot, 24 foot Chris uh, uh, boats. If you ever, if you had one of those, or with the original nickel silver on it, uh, from a 
value standpoint down the road, if you are tired of the de of, of not being able to of the polishing of that vote, uh, rather than uh, we are now at a point where rather than nickel uh, than chrome plate the nickel, I would take all of that hardware off of that vote, put it in a box, and replace with the replacement replica hardware, chrome plated everything on that boat because down the road on the other side of the hill that may be something you, you can't reverse it easily once you plate nickel silver and then try and strip it the stripping process to get chrome off attacks the nickel and it makes it makes your problems uh, quite difficult to get that back ever again to really good looking nickel silver so if I if I had a boat like that and I and I own one that is that way, and uh, the choice is either to polish the nickel silver or to replace all the hardware with replica hardware chrome plated. Once again, Gary, you must tell these people too. They most of them probably know, but yeah. we're talking about boats from the twenties. Twenties. We're talking about triple cockpit yeah. boats, mostly nickel silver boats that are are boats that are worth big dollars. When we're talking about big dollars, we're talking in excess of, of fifty thousand dollars. Yeah. So you're in a in a different league with that the, group. <laughs> you're 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 at a point now where the boats are about fifteen years behind where cars were. And the difference of you can look at a lot of the things that have happened to many of the uh, greater uh, the Packards, the touring cars, the, the Cords, Auburns, Duesenbergs, etc. And what those cars did in their value uh, when you're dealing with a few thousand, five, six, seven, eight, nine thousand vehicles versus a high production run of 800, 900, 1,000, the boats are about 15 years difference between the cars. They will never, you know, if you're looking at it saying that, oh, well, you know, gee, I know somebody that had a, a Duesenberg that bought it for 15,000 and now it's a $2 million car. Uh, I'm not saying that with the boats at all. I don't think that that will happen in the foreseeable future to the boats because the number of people that have interest in it is smaller than the number of people that have interest in the cars, but growing. So they will appreciate, it's kind of like a crystal ball to look and see what will and how much and where. You can look back at you know, 1974, 1984, 1994, and see what things sold for then, and we had a, you know, inflation in there and all of that. So, it's much, it's a much more even, steady growth because of the increase of the number of people getting interested in it. But it isn't the kind of meteoric rise that you see with with antique cars, necessarily. And it's about 15 years behind. Tom, uh, I've chosen to go the route of buying a mid-sized cruiser. 50s vintage. I like the curves and stuff. And um, for people who look at cruisers, I live in the Detroit area. You can usually buy derelict boats for a song, and I, I've kind of considered that it's worth paying very little for them and then spending some money pulling all the planks off to see how bad they are. So in the case of the first one I got, which was a 27-foot sedan cruiser, when we pulled planks, the chines got is going to need work. Several of the ribs are bad. So it's one of those things where the value of the boat, based on what I've studied by looking in the publication, suggests that it's going to be way beyond repair. So what would you fellows recommend when you've got a pair of twin Ks and you've got original chrome and stuff like that? What do you, if you have to make the decision to part out a boat, um, should you use publications like you would advertise a, a boat for sale? I'm currently trying to look at selling it as what I call a puzzle project to see if somebody's interested in picking it up from where I've left off. But if I have to go that route, how would you see, uh, should I use a broker or should I attempt to sell it myself to generate what I think I could get from it? Well, <laughs> good luck. Good luck. No, <laughs> the, uh, it's not all bad. Uh, the, the, the three most valuable things you have on that boat are the engines and the, and the instruments. There's a few pieces of hardware that relate to the runabouts. That's even to the uh, even if, if you had a 40 foot cruiser of the same vintage, there are some things on there that are valuable to the runabout restorer because the runabouts are the most valuable. And uh, uh, many of those many of the models built in the 40s, 
30s and 40s are worth as much as a 60-footer in a cruiser. So the, the, the instruments in that boat, a couple of the other pieces of hardware, the light fitting on the top of the mast, uh, and the engines uh, are the most valuable part from that standpoint. And out there, there's somebody with a, with, a, with a utility or a runabout that would dearly love to have the thing running for a reasonable price that would be glad and happy to get an engine that they could make run. And, and I've bought a lot of cruiser engines over, over the years uh, that we've pulled left, made left hands out of right hands and pulled the timing gears out and changed them and so forth because those are parts in there. And often those engines are low hour or not as hardly driven as a runabout engine. And uh, so somebody out there, I, I would advertise in the, in, the, in the local antique, whatever the, ant, you know, all the ones, Wilson's and antique classic boat and the local uh, chapter newsletter. Uh, and uh, you'll likely find somebody. As a last resort, there are guys who do nothing but deal in engines, antique engines. Come see me. <laughs> I, I, I'm, clo I'm close by. <laughs> and, and, uh, but the point is not to just, I, I cringe when I see something go to a junkyard because that doesn't get, that means nobody has a chance to do anything with it. I had, I had a conversation with a fellow in California who had a boat that was a disaster, uh, uh, everything else with it. He was going to put an ad in the local paper and you know, just offer it to anybody that would take the thing. And, and I told the guy, I said, you know, before you do that, take, do me a favor, take a month and, and do it through the, ant, through the antique group there and see if you can get it to somebody that will appreciate what it is because there are things in that boat as bad as it is that somebody really needs. The other thing is, do you really want a 27-foot semi-enclosed cruiser, whatever that model was, you know, it is possible that you could find another boat out there that may have a super hull and be missing the exactly. engines or whatever. So if that is the boat that you personally want in your future, try to find it, That's another right. one. And you may be able to use everything that you have or a good part of it. That's, that's exactly so that's the decision you have to make once again. That's, that's what we were saying before with the uh, find the best boat that you can, spend more money for, a, for the best version of it you can find and then use that as your spare parts, as your backup, if that's the boat that you, you know, your Uncle Harry had or somebody, or an interest, a reason that you want that boat. And if that's it and you're not going to get rid of it and, and you can have it and it fits with what you want to do with it, well, that's the way to go. Moving right along. I have two questions. But first I'll just tell you, uh, uh, about two years ago, Galveston Yacht Service replaced about 75% of the bottom, including the keel on my 46-foot Connie. And I'll just tell you, that's big bucks, but, uh, <laughs> even, even for a plumber. <laughs> but actually, I, I also have a 1959 model 21-foot Capri that I've owned about 13 years, and it has the original double plank bottom, and when it sits on the trailer for a while, you can literally see the ground through the, through the cracks. And the only way I've found that, uh, to do that is to put water inside the boat uh, for about three days before I ever put it in the water. I've been told that's not a good idea, but I don't know how else to do it because it would sink if I tried to launch it. Uh, and the other thing is I'd like to hear some discussion about modern-day gasoline and old engines. Well, <clears throat> let's go to the gasoline because that's more, more in my alley. Uh, I think any of the gasoline, you got the 87 octane out here, will work in almost any of the engines other than the V8s. The old flatheads probably would live with about 80 octane fuel. So getting 87, and of course you probably won't find any 87 on the water, it's all 89 or 92 or 93. Uh, I would say that you're, if you use the premium fuels and any of the, uh, the special, uh, such as the Cadillacs, you'd have to use probably a 93 octane. All the 283s seem to run very ni nicely on the 89 octane. Uh, you can't. You can't. If you could buy, if you could buy some lead, it would. It's. I use a little lead. I have lead additives that I add in when I when I rebuild an engine, because lead is a lubricant. Uh, actually, the elimination of lead uh, from fuel has been been good in some respects. A lot of the sludge you got in the crankcase in the old engines was lead. Uh, a lot of the buildup on the valves was lead. Um, 
Lead was an anti uh, an anti knock compound, as well as a lubricant. The um, I don't think you have any, have any trouble really running in any of these engines out here, on the fuels that you're getting on the water today. Without additives. Well, okay, you're talking about additives. Uh, I worked for the chemical division of Chrysler Corporation for seven years, and they they manufactured or we manufactured all the. Uh, Mopar products that you would bought when you went, used to go to the dealer. I don't know if they're still out there or not. And uh, they had all kinds of what we called mouse milk that you put into your fuels and then your radiator stop leaks and et cetera, et cetera. And that's exactly what we called it was mouse milk. Um. Uh, Pete, before we get too far into that subject, let me ask Tom if this is not an area we're going to get into tonight after dinner. And should that we want to hang on to some of these questions about... <laughs> well, are we on the right track, Gordon? Keep talking. Keep talking. Okay. Uh -huh. <laughs> well, I'll not attempt to introduce tonight's speaker now, but uh. the, okay. Uh, the next. Where's the, the microphone? Well, wait a minute. Right I, here. Want to, sec, I want to sec, finish the, the second part. Was, the answer was it's, it's, uh, whatever it is, mouse well, a lot of the valve tech and all these things. Um, yeah. I. They're, they're fairly costly for any, any benefit received. Yeah. The second part of the, the question that you had with the boat and looking through the bottom, uh, early on we were talking about what the use that you're going to put the boat to is, and uh, that is the area where you have to ask yourself uh, and, and make the decision what kind of a bottom you're going to leave on the boat or how original you're going to keep it or what's going to happen after that. If you are going to trailer the boat, keep it in the garage, and use it maybe once every other month type of use or boat show time or whatever like that where it does not get regular in-water use. Uh, that's where you might want to think about taking, even if, even if the bottom is a very good original bottom, what is missing now is the canvas in between. Taking the original bottom, outer planking, off of that boat, and the inner bottom may be in very, still very good condition, but it gives you the chance to find out. And then setting that bottom, the planks back in, in a 5200 uh, adhesive inner layer, replacing the canvas that's there, will make that boat just as original as it was before. It looks, rides, everything else uh, as original, but will not leak, and gives you the ability to put that boat in the water at pretty much at will, safely. The second thing that happens, and, and, and we've had the discussion with West and, and uh, epox uh, an epoxy bottom and a laminated bottom and all kinds of, I mean, there's a, a vast variety of ways of doing things. But in, in a boat that is an original hull that has not been completely built from the top to the bottom, in other words, completely apart, and you're dealing with original decks and original hull sides and you're going to put something on the bottom, to me, there is only one way that you can do that, and that's to do it with the 5200 that, in that what we just described, because that moves and will flex with the boat, which the rest of the boat will do. If you make that solid and the rest of it is original, it starts to flex more up on the top because the bottom is moving very little. If you are doing a boat from scratch, taking it right down to the bottom and laying the frames on the floor and patterning everything else, then there is nothing wrong with an epoxy boat that's laid over plywood under laminate and all this stuff to stabilize all the planking and make it so it doesn't crack and the seams don't open up, particularly if you live in the Florida or Southern environment. Nothing wrong with it because you've built a complete solid boat. And that's, that's kind of, you know, a... a but most restorers would look at it in very much the same way because of what happens when you combine things. So that may be an answer that you would look at. Uh, I'd just like to say one thing in reference to that. I had a, a customer come to me that I sold a, an old boat to that had an original bottom and so on and so forth, and he did not live on a lake and whatever, and he trailed the boat. And I asked him, how do you manage to keep that bottom so tight? He says, well, I put it in my garage, and I put some old carpeting on the floor, and I wet it. And believe me, every time that man comes and puts his boat in the water, it does not leak. It's a neat trick. I don't know what kind of carpet it has, but you know, a lot of times when carpet gets wet, it doesn't smell too good. But uh, 
He seems to have been surviving for the last several years with, with that type of situation. Just the big follow. thing is the uh, amount of moisture you can keep in that area with the boat is. I've stored. seen people take and put a plastic skirt around the boat and then mm -hmm. use a humidifier underneath. And uh, this keeps the, the moisture in the bottom area. I've noticed that the gas and brass cars around 1910, 1918 have started going down in value. And it's because today's population wants to be on the big highways and be able to drive the cars. And the old cars just don't hit the speed limit. From an investment standpoint, where when you're talking about bigger engines and more speed in some of the boats, do you see any drop off having started or starting in the 20s and 30s boats from the standpoint that today's population is more apt to pay bigger dollars for the boat that goes a little faster? Definitely not. <laughs> I've come down to Florida. I'll take you out in the 29 that does 51 miles an hour. Can't beat it with the Riviera. Any of the, 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 in the boats, going back in the 20s, Pete's got a 20s boat that, that will go 42, 42 miles an hour. There aren't too many boats that you buy in a production boat today with because they're going the other way, littler and littler engines because they're trying to stay within all the gas things and what's available from Detroit is becoming less and less horsepower wise. The big V8s, 440s, 454s are harder and harder to come by because Detroit is making smaller and smaller engines higher and higher RPM engines. So these older boats with either modern power or original power will run every bit as fast as anything you can get today with a lot more fun. I if you quick. recall the uh, thing about the racers this morning, that 36 racer was advertised to do 45 to 47 miles an hour and the post-war one, the 54 oh. one, was the 44 mile an hour boat. And if you want to go faster than that, there's a couple of guys around that are doing 70 with them. <laughs> no, I have a question. For where's the, the, where's the, the mic? And the question. Stand, stand up if you would. I have a uh, question for the panel that hasn't been attended because you're talking about to protect your investment. Where do you use a surveyor? When you want to sell your boat or when you want to buy a boat? And, Heather, and where do you get a good one? Well, You'd want to use a surveyor when you buy a boat. You want it surveyed before you buy it so that you're getting good value. And you let the, the new owner, the fellow that you're trying to sell it to, let him have the expense of a survey on the boat. If, uh, if you are a person who does not know very much about an antique boat at all, uh, one of the problems that you have uh, in with surveyors today is that they also do not have an awful lot of information or knowledge in wood boats. And finding the right surveyor, it becomes very uh, important and, and is rather difficult. The other alternative is uh, if you find and live in an area where there's a small rest restoration shop and uh, you may be you know, buying some material or doing something from him, or go in and talk to the individual and offer to pay him to go and look at a boat for you, with you. And there's a lot of fellows out there that will do that. And, and they're not necessarily, yeah, they'd like to do some work for you. But if you've explained to them honestly, up front, what you, that you want to restore something yourself and you want to make sure that you get a fairly good boat and you're willing to pay a fair price for his time to go and look at it, there's quite a few people that will do that. I've done it for, for customers and have no qualms at all with doing that. Uh, and there's a lot of ways you can find those, you know, uh, who is reading the publications will often tell you people that are available in an area. But if you know nothing about the boat at all or, or very little about it, that's, you need to find somebody uh, through your antique classic boat group, through the local chapter or whatever that will go and look at a boat with you. I was going to say, that's probably one of the biggest advantages belonging to the ACBS is that within the chapter, you will probably find somebody who can recommend somebody who knows about the, the kind of boat that you're interested in. And, and that's another thing that you want to watch out for. Uh, don't get the guy that may be up to his ears and crisscrafts like Terry Feist is into Cobras.
to ask you to tell you about the value of a Hutchinson uh, or a Richardson. Uh, find somebody who's into Richardsons or into Hutchinsons that can tell you about that kind of boat because they know where to look for the defects and, and they know better about the values. So if you can spot a mark club that deals in that kind of thing, you can get some help there too. Don? One of the, one of the things that sent the uh, vintage car market through the ceiling was the speculators. And of course, that bubble has burst now, and those cars have come way off their values over the last year or so. Have you all seen any evidence of speculation in the uh, vintage boat market? Very, very, very few. And those that have gotten involved with, uh, in, in my particular case, those who have gotten involved, say they were into cars, they're really super car uh, specialists and thought they were going to get into the boat market, uh, really didn't have any true love for the boats. I found that to be the, the, the major key of their, of their downfall, and they were really just looking for the investment. The ones that I was in contact with all had the boats for a year or two years, and they wound up at selling them in tremendous losses because they just didn't understand the boats, and they, it really wasn't part of their life. <laughs> well, I don't know. I, I, I can't agree with you on that point because this one particular individual, I followed him around and he took me all over to his restoration shops where he was buying uh, ostrich skins and pending, spending $7,000 for a skin and it took 10 skins to do a seat. I mean, you're talking about mega, 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 mega bucks. And uh, I sold him a, a super boat that was uh, the best uh, in the country of what it was. And he sold it for 50% uh, of what he paid for it in two years. He just didn't want it. Tom? I'm finding quite a few people are coming and starting to change where I think the evolution is going through the same as what it did in the 20s to the 30s, where we're getting more interest in people wanting utilities in semi-enclosed. And I think a lot of people might be a little premature in scrapping these things, where in another few years down the road, as the people of that era who relate to grandfather that had one of those a semi enclosed will be wanting to get it back into those because I think most of us that are into this business are relating to boats that we grew up with in our era and as the change we're going to see the changes in boats and this is what's made the 57 Chevy popular because it was in our era and this is what's going to make a 67 car more valuable and I think the same is going to be happening in boats. Well, that's where, what Wayne was saying before we started out was that every one of these boats has value. And, and whether that be 10 bucks, 100 bucks, 10,000, or 100,000. I hate to see people destroying things prematurely. They have a possible way of saving it. Yeah. Well, I think that's the But that helps bring the price up, though, if they destroy them. For the ones <laughs> <laughs> Uh, incidentally, Tom, I, I didn't mean to leave out the hackers, and if you need an appraisal on a hacker, Tom Flood's probably one of the better guys in America to do that. I know you're all experts in your fields, but... We're outstanding 50, in our field, too. Yeah, 5200 <laughs> is a glue. I wouldn't have you do any of my boats with that stuff. I've taken work boats apart, and uh, the 5200 was intact. Nothing wrong with it, but it won't stick to wet wood. It won't stick to oily wood. My estimate on doing a job is you clean your wood with the solvent to get the oil out if you can, and then use boatyard bedding compound, put the cotton back in it, and then use seam compound, which will not harden, but as the boat the planks seal, the bedding compound or the seam compound will come out and you'll have a dry boat. 5200 isn't worth the damage. It's a glue for above the water. 101 is for below the water. But your bedding compounds are, are your, your compound of yesteryear, and once again, you get down into the, the personal preferences, and, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're perfectly valid in, in stating that that's what you want to use. And uh, like I say, I've done 5,200 bottoms since uh, for 25 years, and I've, I've found that uh, they're just a little bit better in the aspect that they don't move as much. In other words, you, with your bedding compound in there, what's going to happen is your planks are going to move. And as they move over the years, eventually that'll break down. And what will happen is the exact same thing that happened after the 25 years that the original stuff was in there. 
I mean, I know we still have to go a few more years to find out exactly what the 5200 is, is going to do, but you know, I don't want to argue with you, but it is really one of those personal preference elements. And, uh, It probably will not come apart. <laughs> right down here in front. Well, can I? There's, there's, no, there's one part, part that I want to make a point here. Uh, first of all, the, the, if we're de talking about a Chris Craft bottom, the bottom was put together with white lead and, cot and, uh, and uh, canvas. It was not put together with uh, bedding compound other than at the chines and the keel. It also was not put together with caulking cotton or seam compound of any kind. The bottoms are laid up tight, right plank to plank, with no caulking cotton and no seam compound in it. When we're talking about 5200, we're talking about replacing the canvas inner layer that was laid in white lead, which is no longer A, available, B, toxically usable in water today, with instead of a different material, and some people use fiberglass, some people use epoxy in glass cloth, some people use uh, hypalon, which is the old convertible top material in between, because the boat has to have something between the inner bottom and the outer bottom. It was built that way originally. The 5200 inner layer solves all of the problems in giving it a pliable surface, even surface, it holds the wood together, it holds the fastenings, the bottom to the inner bottom, and if you set the inner bottom in it also, it holds that where they used to use galvanized or steel nails to set the uh, uh, herringbone, the, the diagonal inner plank in, and replaces the original canvas. So in a Chris Craft, you're dealing with a, a boat that did not have a caulked bottom. It was laid up tight, and all the 5200 does is replace what was there originally in a better technically correct format. The other point is that the material uh, goes back in the Chris Craft Sea Skiff, for example, all the way back into 54, 55, 56, when they glued the first skiffs together and actually built a boat that's still floating in Pompano Beach, uh, and I believe it was a 30-footer, that was put together with the essentially the same material, thiocol, and then everything removed, and the boat was held, it was done with no fasteners, and the boat is still alive. I've seen the boat, and it's still in Florida, and that was done in 55, and maybe Chris Smith can answer it better exactly. Isn't that correct, Chris? So that boat was also you know, Right. And we Just to find out how strong... That's right. That's right. And that boat is still floating because I've seen it. Well, it was about ten years ago that I saw it, but it's still still operating the same way. Well, now, but back up to that to, to, in that area. When a boat is, when you do the bottom with 5200, if you're if the planks are all oil soaked, you're going to replace them because that. Then, then you don't have a good bond surface. If they're mildly or somewhat oil-soaked, you can wipe them with xylene. It neutralizes and removes the surface layer and creates a bond that I will show you test samples that we've done, and I do them every couple of years, and I did them 10 years ago, and glued the stuff together with the worst oil-soaked bottom I could find, wiped it with xylene, stuck the two together, and pulled the wood apart to get it out. Because none of us do anything on a boat without being pretty darn sure of, of what happens before we, because nobody wants to have to take it apart and fix it on, on your own dollar if you've done it wrong. And now moving back to value, let's get over to the patient gentleman who's been standing. It's nice to see that quite a few builders today are building wooden boats again. But I'm especially interested from an investment point of view how you judge the three people who have been for years building replicas or reproductions, Bill Morgan in Hacker, the Turco brothers in Garwoods, initially Steve North Hughes in Chris Craft, and I became very much involved in the Grand Craft boats. How do you judge the, 
at least both from the investment point if somebody is buying this kind of a car. <laughs> that was, we're smiling because we had this discussion. <laughs> we, we were hoping that, it wouldn't come up. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's a tough one to answer. Uh, only time will tell on that one. Um, I, would, I would personally rather buy an original, uh, depending on the purpose you have in mind. If you want something to run around and enjoy uh, and use it like you would any other boat, whether you bought a Donzi or um, something of that nature, fine. Um, the, I, I don't think they're going to hold their value at this time. It would be like buying a new car, buying a new Cadillac or whatever, it's going to drop in value. That's kind of my opinion. I'm not trying to knock them. They're, do, they're doing, a, doing a service. They're keeping the, uh, the old boats alive. Uh, I think it, um, I've thought about it at one time or another after working on my old one. <laughs> Next. <laughs> Where did the mic get well, to? Well, there's, there's, there's two different categories to me. Uh, if you were looking at it and saying, I, I want to build a particular boat that I've seen a design or something that no longer exists, like a replica, uh, Miss Minneapolis, Miss Columbia, something like that, fine, great, because it can be a bed for a, for a very neat old engine uh, or because you like the boat, and that's fine. Uh, as far as the values for replica boats that are production replicas, Garwood's hackers, whatever they may be, uh, the, it's very difficult to determine what that value is going to be and, and what they're worth after they're two years old or four years old. Uh, the ones that I've seen, and I've owned a couple of them that I've either traded in or bought and sold, uh, have been bought for substantially less for very nice boats than they, than they cost when they were new. So from that standpoint, only having done that on a couple of them, uh, could I answer it in that way? It basically, once again, comes down to what do you really want? That's, that's really where it lies. That's right. For do you want an people. old boat or do you want a new boat? And there, are, there are many people that should not own a, a, an original antique boat because what they're going to do with it uh, or the way they want to use it doesn't match well with it. Uh, or where they may be using it doesn't match as well with it. And uh, uh, Ken Bassett has been working in my shop this winter, and I had had a, a, a discussion a couple of times. And you know, Ken's philosophy is, well, we'll never have antique boats if we don't build new wood ones. So you know, there's a there's a viewpoint for a lot of uh, different ways of approaching it. Uh, do you see the uh, value of uh Non-tradable boats being pretty flat compared to the tradable boats in the big picture. I think almost any boat, if I understood, is trailerable. Uh, I mean, the larger boats, cruisers, cruisers. You mean cruisers and motor yachts and that type of thing? Uh, there's a, uh, well, in the, if you get into the yacht area, there's some interesting things that you see happening uh, there in Elko's and uh, uh, Trumpy. Uh, some of the, the real classic yachts have, have appreciated a lot in the last couple of years. Nobody wanted them, and they were kind of this lost in the woodwork. Uh, the in-between area of the production-built boats, mm, there's, I guess things are pretty even, you know, it's sort of there. But they all have a, they, there's all a value. If you go down and price a new 36-foot cruiser today, I'll tell you that a wood 36-foot cruiser has a very definitely increased value because this, there's a huge span between a quarter of a million, half a million bucks and $20,000. And you can have an awful lot of fun at $20,000. <laughs> if you buy the right boat. But typically, don't you find that the runabouts are more popular, and because they're more popular, they are comparatively at least priced higher comparatively than the cruisers, which are 
have got to be housed. That's anywhere from $100 to $400 a month uh, dockage fees, uh, more maintenance. Now, there are some little pockets like out in Seattle. Seattle's covered up in cruisers out there. And if I were looking to sell one, if I could get it out there, that's probably where I'd take it. And if I were looking to find one, there's probably a market out there. I don't know. Lou Rouse out here. Lou deals in boats. Uh, maybe Lou's got some observation on whether you can sell cruisers as opposed to trailerable boats. Yeah, they're good bargains. But I, and my, I guess part of my knowledge too is based upon the people who say, "Wilson, I got a boat and I'll give it away." You know, uh, it all and, and they don't find that happen there with runabouts. Not it very all often. comes back to what we've said and Wayne has said a couple times. It's all in what you want to do with it, what you're going to use it for. That's right. You're sitting, we're sitting right in the middle of an area that would be a very good place for the enjoyment of a 27, 28 foot Chris 50s cruiser. It's very traditional. If you don't mind, if you have the skill and time and want, and part of the work is the fun of doing the work, just like people who build cabinets and furniture. That part of it, if that's what you're looking at, that's, that is actually an enjoyable part of maintaining the boat. That boat becomes a lot of fun for a family. Uh, I know my family, we, we, grew, we had all the way through our kids growing up had uh, sea skiffs and 27, 28, 30 footer, 36 footer, plus the runabouts. And uh, uh, I have a 25 year old son who's in the business now who grew up around that, doing that on a boat. So yeah, it's all. But you know, remember Where, that, what, you're gonna do with it. what was it, 24 foot sea skiff? We looked at down at home with Sasa, sitting there for $750. Great. I mean, we had a couple of worms in the bottom, yeah, and it needed a little fixing up, but you know, uh, it, Not that bad. but it was a big, bigger boat. <laughs> Just uh, in terms of what the preserving value of what the strata are, I'm a newcomer to the mahogany runabout field, although I try to collect a lot of things. Maybe this is unfair, but since with this expertise up there, if uh, I didn't bring my checkbook, but if it, I, I did, and I could only write checks and multiples of $10,000, you can stop at the top end wherever you want, but I would love to get a feel you know, for 10000 We're talking, you said the best investment is a near mint, let's say, model. Mm -hmm. For 10000 20, 30, 40, you can stop when you want. What, I mean, my impression is the big, 25-foot Chris Crafts, they're $100,000, and for $10,000, you can get a nice 17-foot late yeah. model 50s boat. But what's your sense of the strata? If you have a minute, I'll show you. The... Obviously, you've probably seen the uh, copy of the two most popular boats talked about here today, the 19-foot Racer and the Cobra. And right. Uh, <laughs> if, if, you, if, you, if you buy... Can, where's the, give, take Gary the mic, can you, Tom? Tom? Oh, I'll just yell a little louder. Can you hear me? Yeah, no, we, can't, we can't record you without that. Oh, okay. Uh, if you were going to start at uh, somewhere between a low of eight and uh, tw in the range of eight to $20,000, in a utility boat, you could find uh, a, a U-22 sportsman from a user condition which is a boat that's in reasonably good shape leaks a little bit the engine's a little bit tired but she runs good and looks half decent to the 20 range uh, plus where it would be 2025 where it'd be a show boat you know, or very close to one uh, that's a utility boat that comes in in two versions uh, basically that look just like that you've seen it in the old on golden pond movie that's the boat it comes in an 18-foot and the 22-foot. That particular style of boat, as a sportsman, was built all the way through the 30s, all the way into the 40s, all the way into the 50s, as essentially that layout just becoming more modern at each stop. If you go into the 40s and 30s, the 40s and 30s models, they are a little bit more expensive because they're rarer. Is that based on kind of material? That's approximately, if, if, you, if we went through uh, classic boating and uh, uh, brass bell and rusty rudder and looked at the for sale uh, trade sections and so forth, 
we could find those boats in that range for sale in there. That's, that's what that's based on. And uh, the only way you can tell it beyond that is if you questioned everybody four months, six months later and found out if they sold the boat and said, how much did you sell it for? Or you hear the boat sold or we ourselves have sold it in, in our businesses. And that tells us what you as consumers are willing to pay for the boat. After a higher collector value, then you get into the barrel backs. This is a 17-footer. Uh, these will be in the 15 to 20, mid 20s range. What does that get you? A very high quality one or a medium one? Or one? The higher up you go in price, the better the level is going to be. That one, uh, it would be in the 20 range, wouldn't you say, Wayne? Yes, most definitely. The barrel sterns, as, as most of you probably know, are, are one of the most desirable and one of the most collectible type boats. They were built basically in the, the very late 30s up till about 1942. I don't know what the actual numbers as far as production are, but those are, quote, the most collectible. That's a type of boat, if you have another boat, you might want one of these to just put on the shelf and maybe take to special shows or just use it for special occasions. They're just very yeah. desirable, as is the racing runabout in the Cobra. And that's a, that's a boat that if you were, for example, here on the Chesapeake Bay or on a large lake, is a boat that you would not want to be riding around a lot in, especially in the 17-footer, because it is, it's a fairly wet boat. But it's a great collector boat because it was a three-year production boat uh, built only in three sizes. And, and each of the years looked different from the year before. So it, it's a, quite a rare boat. Uh, Gary, is it safe to say the farther west you go, the more expensive that boat's going to get? Used to be, but California has had tough times, just like Canada has. <laughs> so the first time, used to be that when boats went west, they never came east again. You couldn't afford to buy them back here for the difference in the prices. In the last few years, things have actually come back from California. So it's a little bit different than it was a few years ago. Gary, what is a boat like that worth in tough shape right now, if it needs uh, to be totally restored? The, uh, one of those in pretty tough shape, um, nine, ten. Okay. Uh, it a lot depending on which engine's in it. Thanks for listening. Copyright 1995 by the Antique Boat Museum and the Antique and Classic Boat Society. Audio copyright 2019 Freedom Boat Service, LLC.